لمحمد خير الشبائل وكامل وهي الدلال السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome once more to our Sira class the last thing that we spoke about was the establishment of the first project of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and that was the building of the masjid in Medina. So the first project the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam embarked upon in Medina was to build a masjid. And the second thing that he did was to establish a brotherhood, <clears throat> which is extremely important in Islam. But what type of brotherhood did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam establish? Was it something, you know, passive? Today we say that, you know, I'm a Muslim brother and I'm your Muslim brother. And, you know, sometimes it comes out being very, very passive and we really don't mean what we say. What type of brotherhood that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam established between the Muslims in the early stages of Islam? These Muslims were brothers just as blood brothers. They were brothers just as blood brothers, meaning that even in inheritance, in the early stages of Islam, the rules of inheritance would be applied to blood brothers and those who were made brothers to one another. And an example of this would be the relationship between the Muhajirun and the Ansar of Sa'ad bin Rabia and Abdurrahman ibn Awf radiallahu ta'ala anhum. Abdurrahman ibn Awf radiallahu ta'ala was a muhajir and he was made a brother to Sa'ad bin Rabi'ah. And Abdurrahman ibn Awf was from Makkah. Sa'ad bin Rabi'ah was from Medina. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he used to pair them off and make them brothers. So Abdurrahman ibn Awf radiallahu ta'ala and he would stay in the house of Sa'ad bin Rabi'ah. So Sa'ad bin Rabi'ah, he said to Abdurrahman ibn Awf radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said, oh my brother, I'm one of the wealthiest men in Medina. I will divide my wealth in half and I will give half to you. And I'm married to two women. You can take a look at either of them and make your choice and I will divorce her and after her death, you can marry her. I mean, well, you don't see these things happening today. I mean, this was the level of sacrifice that they were willing to make and go to. Abdurrahman ibn Awf radiallahu ta'ala, and he said to Sa'ad bin Rabi'ah, he said, Barakallahu laka fi ahlik wa malik. May Allah bless you, may Allah bless you in your wealth, and may Allah bless your family. So, I mean, show me the way to the market. I mean, that's good, but... I'm not interested in your wealth. I'm not interested in your family. May Allah bless your wealth. May Allah bless you and your family. But just show me the way to the market. So Sa'ad bin Rabi'ah, he showed him the way to the market of Bainu Qaynuqa. Abdurrahman ibn Awf, I mean, subhanAllah, Allah has blessed his wealth. Abdurrahman ibn Awf became one of the most wealthiest person in Medina. He was a good tradesman. So very early on, he was able to establish himself and become a very wealthy person. He went to the market and he worked and he made some money. So one day the Prophet Sallallahu he met uh, Abdurrahman ibn Awf ta'ala whilst he was walking and he saw some yellow powder on his face, sufra. Now this yellow powder was a powder that the woman used to use to, as makeup. So he asked him, oh, Abdurrahman, did you get married? And he said, yes. So well, what did you give her as her mahr? He said, oh, Prophet of Allah, I gave her the size of a date seed in gold. So, I mean, Abdurrahman ibn Awf radiallahu ta'ala was already able to buy gold, which is an expensive, you know, an expensive... A precious stone, it's very expensive. 
whether you go to Japan or Russia or wherever you may go on the face of the earth, it's expensive. People say, well, gold is ex uh, cheap in, Med in Mecca and Medina, but when you go, it's, it hurts your pocket. It's expensive. I mean, probably it's a little cheaper than Trinidad, but it's expensive still. So he had already had enough money to purchase gold. So the Prophet ﷺ, he says, Awlim wa bishat. Have a walima and sacrifice even if it be a goat or a sheep. Then the brothers used to give each other advice. They were advices to each, advices to each other as in the case with the brotherhood of Salman Farsi and Abu Darda radiallahu ta'ala. Now Abu Darda was an abad. I mean, he was a great worshiper in Allah. He was a zahid. He was disinterested with this world and he loved to be in a state of solitude. So Abu Darda was an abid. He will fast and he will pray in the night. And another person who was classed as a great abad was Abd Ab Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al As radiallahu ta'ala. Abdullah ibn Umar used to finish the Quran in one day. He used to complete the Quran in one day. And he will stand the night in ibadah. He will fast in the day. And mind you, he will finish the Quran in the night in salah. And his father, uh, Amr ibn al-As, he went and he complained to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, Messenger of Allah, my son is killing himself in ibadah. You need to speak to him. So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he calls uh, Abdullah ibn Umar and he said, "Well, how long do you take to finish the Quran?" He said, "Well, I finish the uh, complete the Quran in one day." He said, "Well, how about you finish it once a month?" So oh, Prophet of Allah, I can do much better than that. I mean, Abdullah ibn Umar is negotiating with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in ibadah. So well, why don't you finish it in a week? He said, "Oh, Prophet of Allah, I can do much better than that." He said, three days." Complete the Quran in three days, and if you do it in less than that, you will not be able to comprehend it. And there is wisdom in that. People recite Quran and they compete. I mean, it's good to compete in finishing Quran. It's, it's really good. Sometimes people in com competition in, in Quran, they recite with such speed and such haste that really and truly they don't comprehend it. And they make so much mistakes that could be avoided. And here it is, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam one of the greatest ubad of the Umar, Abdullah ibn Umar ibn al-As radiallahu ta'ala, in three days. Do it in three days. If you do it in less, you will not be able to comprehend it. So to Abu Darda radiallahu ta'ala, so he was this deep worshipper in Allah. He was a zahid. So Salman Farsi, he came in, and this was, of course, before the law of hijab was revealed. And he saw the wife of Abu Darda, radiallahu ta'ala, and she wasn't taking too much of a care of herself. I mean, she was, oh, she was mutabaddila. She, she was a woman who wasn't taking care of her looks, and she wasn't taking care of the way she dressed. So, Salman Farsi, he asked her, what's the matter with you? I mean, how come you are like this? I mean, why are you keeping yourself like this? So she said, it's because of your brother Abu Darda, he is not interested in this world. He is not interested in this world, so there is no need for me to Look good in front of him. Now this is very important for wives. That they take care of themselves and they look good for their husbands. Of course, it must be the other way around too. So your wives become attracting to you and you become attracting to your husbands. And vice versa. So the man wouldn't have a reason to be, you know, gaping on the outside you know, or something like that, because a wife is always sometimes suspicious of her husband. If he looks to the right, she feels that he's looking at something there, and 
poor man has to walk with his head bent while shopping to the in the malls or something like that. But once there is trust, you know, trust is very important in a relationship. Once there is trust, I mean, you don't have any problem. But both need to take care of each other in looks and physical features for their spouses. And of course, this will be a lesson to the offsprings. So it sends a great lesson to the offspring that they too will do the same. So she said, it's because of your brother, he is disinterested in this dunya. So there is no need for me to look good in front of him because he's not interested in me. So when Abu Darda, he came in, he brought some food and he said to Salman Farsi, here you go, eat up. So Salman Farsi, he said to Abu Darda, radiallahu ta'ala anhum, I am not going to eat until you eat. But Abu Darda was fasting. So he forced Abu Darda to break his fast. Now it's good to fast. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi used to fast on Ayyam of Beed, the white days. He used to fast on Mondays and Thursdays. And as in some narrations it's mentioned that these are the days where the uh, the records of a person is presented to Allah. So how good it would be that on the day your records are being presented to Allah, his servant is fasting only for the sake of Allah. So when the night came, Abu Darda radiallahu ta'ala, and he stood up for Qiyam al the night prayer, Salman Farsi said, go to sleep. So later on in the night, Abu Darda, he wakes up again, and Abu Darda, Salman Farsi said, go back and sleep. And when it was coming close to the morning, he, Salman Farsi, he went to Abu Darda and he said, now you can pray. I mean, all the while I've been fasting my days and I've been performing Qiyam al -Layl in the night, and this man, he came into my house and he said, bully me around. So he went to the Prophet the next day and he said, oh, Messenger of Allah, this man, this man made me break my fast. And he prevented me from performing salah in the night. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said to Abu Darda, Sadaqa Salman. Salman is correct. He's right. Salman Farsi, he said to Abu Darda, and this was narrated to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam later on. He said to Abu Darda, Inna li nafsika alayk al haq. Your body has a right over you. You have an obligation to yourself. So you need to take care of yourself. You will destroy yourself. He says, You have an obligation towards your family and you need to take care of your duties and responsibility. You cannot neglect that. And you have a duty and obligation towards Allah. So you have an obligatory obligation, you have a duty towards your family and you have an obligation and duty towards yourself. You have an obligation and a duty towards Allah. You need to fulfill these obligations. So too we have the same. If a person thinks that waking up for Qiyam al layl will hamper his Fajr Salah, then I mean you need to weigh things. You wake up for Tahajjud and you can't wake up for Fajr. One is Nafil and one is Farud. So you are performing a Nafil and you can't afford to get up for Farud, Fajr Salah. Because I woke up for tahajjud. Allah is merciful. You need to wait. If you feel that you cannot wake up for Qiyam al layl because it will hamper your Fajr Salah, well, I'm not talking about Ramadan, you know. In Ramadan, you make some genuine extra effort. Go to the limit. Show Allah, as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, show Allah your competition in this month. You need to show Allah your competition in the month. So you need to fulfill these obligations. Salman Farsi is given advice to Abu Darda. Why? Because Salman Farsi is more knowledgeable. He spent years in Makkah with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because he was Muhajir. So these two were made brothers and one is given advice to the other. So the Ansar were 
cooperating and they were sacrificing towards the needs of Al Muhajirun. I mean, they didn't know these people. They are newcomers to Medina. But this, but this was the level of brotherhood that the Prophet ﷺ, uh, he created in the hearts of the Muslims. That they were willing to sacrifice, they were willing to cooperate, they were willing to put up with, look after the needs of their Muslim brother. They were willing to do that. Until the Ansar, they came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, Oh Messenger of Allah, why don't you split the palm groves in half and give half to the Muhajir, and we'll keep the other half. I mean, we are offering the Muhajirun half of our palm. Now, this is not ordinary palm trees we see outside planted in front of people's houses. These are the palm trees. And this was their livelihood. The date palm was their livelihood. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said no. So the Ansari said, well, why don't you take care of the work on the farms and then we'll split the harvest between you and us. And the Prophet ﷺ agreed to that deal. So the Muhajirun, they will serve on the farms and uh, we, they, the, the Ansar, they will still split the harvest. The harvest from the date palm. But even that, that did not happen. Because the Ansar, they ended up doing the majority of the work, even on the farms. So the Muhajir, when they came to the Prophet ﷺ and they said, Oh, Messenger of Allah, we have never seen such people like this. We have never encountered such people. They comfort us when they are poor and when they are well off, they are more generous to us. I mean, they work on the farms and then they split the harvest with us and we barely do anything. Now, it wasn't that the Ansar, the, uh, the Muhajir were exploiting the goodness of the Ansar. This wasn't the case. The Ansar were just doing, they were just doing. And to them, probably it was that we are doing something good. And this is something very important for us. You know, sometimes, whilst we are just, you know, walking down our normal life, sometimes Allah gives us an opportunity to do something good. And we need to seize those opportunities. I mean, we shouldn't restrict ourselves and say, well, there are seasons for good and there are seasons for bad. We shouldn't confine doing some good deed to only Ramadan and, well, I'll wait in Ramadan and then I'll give all the sadaqah I can possibly give. When an opportunity comes to do something good, seize the opportunity. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says that do good deeds because you never know what Allah has hiding for you. Do good deeds. You never know what the outcome of it will be. Never know what Allah will give to you for that good that you do. So the, the Muhajir said, we think that they are going to get all the rewards on the day of Qiyamah and leave us with nothing. So the Prophet wasallam he said to them, no, that is not the case. And listen to what he said to them. You know, sometimes people do good to us and we don't know how to repay them because... We are not in a position to probably meet the same good which they did to us. The Prophet ﷺ, he said to the Muhajir, as long as you are grateful to them, as long as you are grateful to them, as long as you make dua for them, that is sufficient. So this shows us the value of being grateful. Sometimes people, you know, they say that, you know, said things like, why are you being so grateful to him? What you, you um, making him feel like he is, you know, like this, or you are praising him, or you know, you're not supposed to praise people. Commending someone is not praising. Commending someone on their achievements is acceptable in Islam. Someone did something good, you show appreciation and you commend them. But people think that that's praising. That is not praising. And it's good to commend people. It's good to appreciate, show appreciation, and commend people for the goodness that they do. Sometimes people are, you know, they are shown appreciation in different ways. 
Sometimes people are shown appreciation who do the work of Islam financially. And they are supported financially. And that gives them a motivation to go further. Sometimes people are shown motivation by some good words that are mentioned about his name by the authorities in the Jamaat. So it becomes an, a motivation for him to continue doing. Sometimes people are shown appreciation in some way or the other by the authorities and that gives them motivation. But my dear respect, the Muslims on all these apps and what, what gives a person motivation to go further? It breaks a person and he feels that all the good that I'm doing is worthless. So nothing is wrong in showing someone some gratitude for the goodness which they have done in a community or on, on, a, on an individual basis, whether it's a home or a person have achieved something, a milestone in his, in his life. He have achieved something, nothing is wrong in that. Even buying a gift for them. People say, oh, no, that's bidah and that's wrong. And people take bidah a little too far. Go too far with it. Until everything will become bidah. The clothes that you wear is bidah. It's not appropriate because it doesn't have the correct length or it doesn't have the correct look. I mean, everything is bidah today. People are just dragging that word all over. So he said to them, as long as you are grateful to them, as long as you keep on making dua for them. So it shows us the value of being grateful to Allah and His creation. Anyone who does good, whether to you or to someone, then we should be thankful to them. We need to be grateful to them. We need to show them some appreciation. Otherwise, they will end up taking all the rewards. Because they are doing this out of the kindness of their heart for the rewards of Allah and you are just taking it and not even saying, well, thank you. And as the Prophet wasallam, he says in a riwayah that is mentioned by uh, Imam Tirmizi and Abu Dawood, Imam Abu Dawood in their sunan, he says, Man lam yashkuril nas, whosoever is not grateful and thankful to people, lam yashkurillah, then he's not thankful to Allah. I mean, you cannot even show people some thankfulness or some gratitude. You think you'll be able to thank Allah? And people think it's difficult to say thank you. But Jazakallah is not thank you. Jazakallah, people think that Jazakallah means thank you very much. Jazakallah means may Allah reward you. So nothing is wrong in saying, well, thank you very much, Jazakallah. But a better, a better phrase to use is Jazakumullah wa ahsanul jaza. May Allah reward you with the best of rewards and that's Jannah. So this is a habit that we need to develop. A habit that we need to develop between ourselves is if someone does some good for us, we need to make dua for them. If someone have done a favor to you, you need to make dua for them. Ask Allah, ask Allah with deep sincerity. Sometimes we say, Jazakallah, and we just say it passively. Well, Jazakallah. <laughs> with no sincerity and no meaning. With no sincerity and no meaning, and this is a part of deen. And as I mentioned, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, says that the one who is not grateful to people, then he is not grateful to Allah. So this relationship between them was in peers, one muhajir, one ansar, and this carried on for a while until the situation of the muhajir improved. Until that situation improved. The laws started to change. This type of relationship was dissolved. Initially, it was like that. Now, the deep love remained. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the inheritance part. This is what I'm speaking about. No longer could they have inherited, but the bond, the strong love and bond remain. But the inheritance part of it was dissolved. The specific type of brotherhood was, this specific type of brother was dissolved. Allah Rabbi Al-Azza, he says in Surah Anfal, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا in verse 75 وَالَّذِينَ أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْ بَعْدِ وَهَاجِرُوا وَجَاهَدُوا مَعَكُمْ فَأُولَئِكَ مِنْكُمْ 
those who believed after immigration, that is the initial migration, migrated Hajaru and they migrated Wajahadu and they fought Mahakum with you. Fa'ulaika minkum, they are of you. Allah is saying they are of you. Wa ulul arhami ba'dukum awla bi ba'di fi kitab Allah. But those of blood relationship, this is something different now. Allah is saying those migrated from Makkah to Medina, they are of you, they are from amongst you. But then Allah says, Wa ula wa ulul arhami ba'duhum awla bi ba'd fi kitab Allah. But those ulul arham refers to blood relations. Ulul arham refers to blood relation. Silla raham is blood relation, blood relatives, blood ties. Silla raham. And raham is derived from the word rahmah. So it's serious business you're dealing with. So people who break off family ties, that's a very dangerous thing that they are doing. They are breaking something which is connected to the arsh of Allah. They're breaking something which is connected to Allah. I mean, sometimes we are in a situation, sometimes people are in a situation where they have to choose sides and we shouldn't put people in that situation. Well, choose them and if you go there, don't bother to come by me. And if you come with me, I don't want you have doing, to do anything with them. This is a sticky situation. One day are Muslim and the other day are blood relatives. People harm you, then overlook their faults. I mean, when you do something wrong, you expect that people overlook you. I mean, if you disobey Allah, you expect that Allah overlook your fault. Isn't that so? Similar is the case that if, you know, you were to, someone were to do you something, then overlook that. Allah will reward you for that. But try at all costs to maintain that blood relationship, that bond. Before you end up becoming aged, and your children grow up and get married and they have kids and then your brother grow up and he's aged and his children grow up and have kids and they don't even know each other. And this is, I mean cousins will pass each other straight on the road and they don't even know that that's their cousin they're speaking to or that's their cousin who's passing there. And it starts, it had a beginning of that. Because the people before never did that. They knew their family, every one of their cousins, and they will treat a distant cousin like he is close blood relative. This is a, but today it's different. No, he's just my third cousin, you know. And, and that's yes, that's a very dangerous thing. Today we don't even know our own families. I think the entire summer people is related to each other. I think Monroe is the same thing. I'm not. I am not a Monroeian. Monroe Rodian. I'm originally from South. So we don't really have that. So Allah Rabbil Isa he says, Wa ulul arhami ba'duhum awla bi ba'din fi kitab Allah and those of blood relationship are more entitled to inheritance. In the decree of Allah, in Allah verily Allah is all knowing of all things. So, this topic of brotherhood, I mean, it's a very important lesson for us. It's a very, very important lesson for us. Now, remember one thing, and keep one thing in mind that the entire community wasn't Muslims. People make it, you know, look as though. That when the Prophet ﷺ, he walked down the streets of Medina, on his entrance into Medina, everyone who was standing up and beating some drum or shaking some palm leaf were Muslim. That, that wasn't the case. You had Muslims and you had Jews and you had pagans and you had Arabs who belonged to different religious sect or group, but they were welcoming to the Prophet ﷺ. They were welcoming. There were people from Al Aus who wasn't Muslim as yet. There were people from Al Khazraj who wasn't Muslim as yet. You had so many people who wasn't Muslim. So when he formed the brotherhood, still 
there were a lot of people in Medina who wasn't Muslim. So probably they were still in the minority in Medina. Just in our case. So there was a great need for them to hold on to this, the strength of this brotherhood which the Prophet ﷺ is now forming between them. And this is the case with us. As Muslims living in a minority, in a non-Muslim state, we need to have that relationship. And do not let our brothers and our sisters become a lone sheep, like, to the wolves. Because sometimes when our brothers and our sisters, they are in need in some way or the other, and they are not assisted by the Muslims, then they become, they become very, very, they become an easy prey. Because the first help that they get, they might swing in that direction. I'm sure you know what I'm speaking about. So, in, in, in Medina, in Makkah and Medina, at that, time you, at that time you had two types of relationship existing. You had the bond that was connected to blood relationship, and then you had an economical relationship. So if you wasn't connected by blood, then you was connected by some, you know, some economical ties. But now a nation is being born based on faith. And that was never the case before. So it was a faith-based community. And we, I mean, we already spoke, we had spoken about the different complications that there was in Medina. When the Prophet ﷺ entered, you had the Arabs, you had the pagan worshippers, you had fire worshippers, you had Arab Muslims, you had the Jews, you had some Christians. You had a mixture just like in our society. It resembles our society. So it was a multi-faith community. It was a multi-faith community. And now you have, and of course you had conflicts. You had conflicts. You probably had people preaching their religion. Come to fire worshipping and you will get everything that you need. Worship this idol and you will get what you need. And you had people probably calling. You have callers to the front uh, groups and sect, just like what you have today. So this brotherhood that the Prophet ﷺ is forming now, it's, he's forming it on Iman. Purely Iman. And I mean, there were problems. When the Prophet ﷺ started to preach Islam, you had problems. And if you can remember the incident when he started to preach to that group of people, Abdullah bin Ubay ibn Salul, he said, don't come and speak about your stories to us. Why don't you go to some people who will listen to you? And the Prophet ﷺ became upset and he left. So the Prophet ﷺ, because war almost broke out. A fight almost broke out between the people in the group because there were one or two people in the group who wanted to listen to the Prophet ﷺ. There were people in the group who, I mean, didn't mind, you know, go ahead and speak. You're a member of the community. There were people who I didn't want to listen, like Abdullah bin Ubay ibn Salul. So you people, uh, a fight almost broke out. So the Prophet ﷺ, he was now building an ummah in Medina that was based solely on faith. Not blood. Not economics. None of these. Only on Iman so the former relationship had to be dissolved. The former relationship had to be dissolved. And I mean, it got dissolved so much that in battle, they didn't care. In battle, they did not care. It was all about Iman. It was all about Muslim. And if you are not Muslim, I mean... Well, after the Battle of Badr, I mean, look at this incident. After the Battle of Badr, Al Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the uncle of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was taken as a captive, a, a prisoner of war. And the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he came to him and said, Ransom yourself. 
Al Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Abbas, he said, but I am a Muslim. <laughs> so the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he said, it does not seem so to us. You were on the side of the unbelievers. You fought against the Muslims. How could you call yourself a Muslim and you, you're telling me you're a Muslim now, but a few moments ago whilst you were fighting with the unbelievers against the Muslim, were you a Muslim then? He said, I could only base my judgment upon what I see, and all I see is that you are against us, against us to ransom yourself. And that was his uncle. After Abu Talib died, it was Al-Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib who became the leader of the Manu Hashim. And it was Al-Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib radiallahu ta'ala, and of course he became Muslim, who took care of the security of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and now they won the battle of Badr, he's telling Al-Abbas who once protected him, ransom yourself. So now it's about Iman. It's not about blood relationship. Now it's about Iman. Allah Rabbul Isa, he says in Surah Tawbah verse 23, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, O you who believe. Or you who have Iman, La tattakhidu aba'akum wa ikhwanakum awliya. Allah says, do not take your fathers. Wa ikhwanakum and your brothers awliya as allies. Do not take your brothers and your father, your, uh, your brothers and your fathers as, as allies. In istahabbul kufra ala al-iman. Why? If they prefer disbelief over Iman, don't take them as your allies. Your brothers and your fathers. Allah is saying that in Quran. Allah says, Whosoever does so amongst you, that verily they are from amongst the Dhalimun, they are wrongdoers. They are wrongdoers. So Allah is telling the Muslims that you need to terminate, you need to dissolve this relationship that you, if you want to go forward, if you want to go forward in this new faith-based community, then you need to dissolve that relationship. The two cannot mix. Because when it comes time for battle, then you will feel that in your heart. Oh, well, it's my cousin. I used to play hoop with him. It's my cousin's son. And I remember we used to sit and eat from the same plate. How can I kill him today? But now he need to dissolve that. Allah Rabbil Isa says in Surah Mumtahina, verse, verse 1, Allah Rabbil Isa, he says, O you who have belief, O you who have faith, do not take my enemies. Allah is saying, do not take my enemies and your enemies as allies. Don't take them as allies. Extending to them affection. For they have disbelief of what came to you of the truth. Having driven out the Prophet and yourselves. Because you believed in Allah your Lord. Now, they drove the Messenger of Allah out because if he stayed, they would have killed him. And if the Muslims had remained in Makkah, then they could not practice their religion as they wanted to. It's either, you know, Abu Jahl, I mean this guy, you know, every Ummah has a Fir'aun. Every Ummah has a Fir'aun. Abu Jahl is a Pharaoh of this Ummah. This man, he was such an evil man. I mean, if in, even in biz, business trade, he said, if anyone follows the religion of Muhammad, if anyone follows the religion of Muhammad, and he's in trade with us, then we will boycott him to that extent where he becomes bankrupt. And if we are unable to do that, then we will beat him up, steal his wealth, and chase him out of town. I mean, that beat up means that probably will kill you. Because he had this, this passionate hate towards the Muslims. Even though he didn't have a right, you know, any reason to hate them. He didn't have a reason to hate them. But it was all about status in Makkah. The people were following Muhammad and they were losing their credentials. The Prophet ﷺ was building this community and they didn't like what they were seeing. 
He was given the poor their rights. He was given the slave their rights. He was given the woman their rights. And I mean, we can't have this guy running a mock in our community, giving the slave their rights. Who is he? Who do you think he is? We have to stop him. So it was all about status in Mecca. This is why they hated Muhammad so much. This is why they hated him so much. And Abu Sufyan, when the Prophet ﷺ got married to his daughter, the people came to Abu Sufyan and they said to him, how can you allow such a thing to happen? How can you allow your daughter to marry Muhammad? You know what Abu Sufyan said to them? He said, I don't have a problem with Muhammad. I mean, the only reason that we have some problem with him is a religion problem, a religious problem. But otherwise, we don't have any problem with Muhammad. So it was the deen. It was the religion. Why? Because the religion was calling towards the worship of one God. And I mean, they didn't like that. The religion was speaking about the rights of humanity. And they didn't like that. No longer could the other elites exploit the, the people who were beneath them. No longer could the rich exploit the poor and take advantage of the situation. Because people were given their rights now. And I mean, you, the elites couldn't have one person causing all this confusion. So they planned to kill the Prophet ﷺ. And the Messenger of Allah had to flee. He had to leave. And the believers who wanted to go to Medina, they had to sneak out of Medina. They couldn't just pack up and say, well, goodbye, Makkah, I'm, I'm leaving, I'm going to Medina now, and go and visit their relatives and say, well, I'll miss you all. It wasn't like that. You know, when we have to go for Hajj, we go and visit all our relatives, and people come to see us off. It wasn't like that. They had to sneak out of Makkah leaving behind everything that they possess and just run for their lives. Only because they wanted to practice the religion of Allah freely. So Allah Rabbil Isa, he is saying, if you had come out for jihad in my cause and seeking a means of my approval, take them not as your friends. Do not take them as your friends. You confide to them affection, do not take them as your friends. But I am most knowing of what you have concealed and what you have declared. So now, I mean, you have new rules. You have new rules and these former alliances, the loyalty that you gave to the tribe has to end. This alliance that you have with these people have to be dissolved. But then you have some specific ayahs that Allah revealed speaking about the relationship of the Muslims with the people of the book specifically. Why? Because you see in Medina, you had the people of the book. You had Jews and you had some Christians living. And the Arabs, they had this ongoing relationship with the Yahud. Now, the Yahud used to look at the Arabs as a bunch of worthless people, a bunch of good for nothing. And the Arabs used to look at the Jews as people who were well educated and well groomed. They used to look at them as people who had a book, a legislation to govern them. And the Yahud, the Jews, they used to take advantage of the situation. They used to exploit that. And whenever the Arabs, they were wealthy people, of course. The Jews were wealthy people. They, whenever the Arabs needed a loan, they used to go to the Jews and they used to take advantage of the situation. And they used to, uh, you know, jack up the interest so much. They will charge them so much interest. Sometimes it was unbearable for the Arabs to pay. So they did that to keep them at bay. Keep you right here. Can't see your way. Whether the relationship was a neighborly relationship or an economic relationship or whether it was just a pact of protection or some political relationship, it has to be dissolved. This relationship has to be dissolved. So Allah Rabbi Isa, 
he began revealing verses to deal with the issue. Allah Rabbil Azza, he says in Surah Al-Ma'idah, verse 51, Allah says, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, la tattakhidu al-yahud wa nasara awliya. Or you who have iman, do not take the Jews and the Christians as your allies. So where did the Muslims go wrong in the world today? Where did the Muslims go wrong in the world today? Allah says, O oh, you who believe, La tattakhidu al-Yahudu, Yahuda wa nasara awliya, do not take the Jews and the Christians as your allies. Do not take them as your protectors. Ba'duhum awliya u ba'd. They are protectors and allies to one another. They are friends to one another. Allah Rabbil Azza, he says, and whosoever takes them as an ally of one amongst you, then indeed Allah says, then you are from amongst them. You are from amongst them. Allah Rabbil Azza, he says, Inna Allah la yahdil Verily, Allah does not guide uh, wrongdoing people, people who are engrossed and involved in wrongdoings. So, what's the meaning of fa'innahum minhum? That you are from amongst them. It means that if a Muslim takes them as your allies or your protectors, then he has shown some sense of disbelief to the command of Allah. Some scholars have even gone so far as saying that they are disbelievers. And this is a very serious thing. Let their track record speak for itself. Anyone who has a history of tyranny and lies, let their track record speak for itself. Allah is telling us don't take them. And we are shouldering our responsibility not to support, uh, not, sorry, we are not shouldering our responsibility as Muslims. Whilst we side with the unbelievers, they are busy killing the Muslims all over the world. I mean, look, yeah, I mean we, we can speak about so many places in the world. Hundreds of thousands are killed and were killed in Iraq and Afghanistan. And the only thing they can say is, well, that was collateral damage. The Prophet wasallam he says the the taking of the life of one person is like the loss of humanity. But people don't care about this, so they just, to achieve their objectives and goals, they just do what they want to do. And that is only to keep the status quo. That is only to keep the status quo. Allah Rabbi al -Azza, he goes on to say in Surah Ali Imran, verse 100 and verse 101, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, again, the addresses to the believers. Abdullah ibn Masood radiallahu ta'ala, he says, whenever Allah starts with this statement, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, then listen very carefully and pay attention because Allah has something very, very important to say. And this is something very important for us. He says, O oh, you who have iman, in tudi'u fariqan min al-ladhina utu al-kitab, yuraddukum ba'da imanakum imanikum kafirin. O oh, you who have Iman, O oh, you who believe, if you obey, a party of those who were given the scriptures, they will turn you back. They will turn you back after you believe. Yaruddukum ba'da Imanikum, Imanikum kafirin, they will turn you back after you believe. Allah says, Wa kaifa takfuruna. And how could you disbelieve? How could you disbelieve? Wa antum tutla alaykum ayatullah. Whilst to you are being recited the book of Allah, wa fikum rasulu, and amongst you is his messenger. Allah saying, how can you disbelieve? When the Quran is amongst you, when the messenger is amongst you, how could you disbelieve? Meaning, how could you take them as your allies? And Allah is telling you, do
Do not take them as your protectors and allies. Do not, you see, awliya can be translated in different ways. Awliya could be friends. Awliya could be protectors. Awliya could be allies. And today the Muslims have taken them for much more than that. For much more than that. They are our closest friends closer than a Muslim. We help them more than we help a Muslim. They are our protectors. And they are protectors even against who we, even the Muslims who we consider as our enemies. We lean on them for protection. And that's a very sad situation in the world today. Where Muslims, Mus the Muslim army will bomb and kill Muslims in a Muslim country. And they don't care and all that is, it's branded with the slogan of, well, we are defending the rights of humanity and we are protecting people from terrorism. And people have taken this word and dragged it and smeared it so badly. And today when terrorism is spoken, only one group or sect of people come to mind. Anytime the word terrorism is used, only one sect of people come to mind. Muslim. Anywhere you travel in the world today, you are looked at. Why? Only because you are Muslim. That's the only reason. I mean, they don't look, for you, look at you for your good looks or your hijab. And if they come to make a conversation with you, they are just trying to be nice. But they are not really nice. They're just trying to make a conversation or something like that because probably they don't have anything better to do. Why, why is the situation like this? Because Muslims, I mean, your own Muslim brothers have taken them as their friends and protectors and their allies, so what can you do? What can you do? So Allah Rabbil Azza, he's saying, وَكَيْفَ تَكْفُرُونَ وَأَنْتُمْ تُطْلَعُ عَلَيْكُمْ آيَاتُ اللَّهِ وَفِيكُمْ رَسُولُ وَمَنْ يَعْتَسِمْ بِاللَّهِ Allah Rabbil Azza, he says, he says, and whomsoever holds firmly to Allah, فَقَدْ هُرِيَ إِلَى سِرَاتِ مُسْتَقِيمِ has been guided to the straight path. So Allah is telling the Muslims that if you follow the ways of the people of the book, you are living amongst the people of Medina, if you follow the ways of these people, then you are going to turn out to be disbelievers. You will turn out to be disbelievers because Allah is telling you, do not take them as your allies and you behind the messenger's back. You are going and speak to them nicely and be friends with them and yeah, yeah, you know, well, you know, it's a Muslim thing going on here, but we are still friends. And you have Muslims like that. When they are with their non-Muslim friends, a world of bad things will be said about Muslims, whether it is in Trinidad or in some other part of the world, and uh, Muslims grin and they laugh and they brush it off as something else and you don't even have that in you to even defend your religion in the least. You, can, you cannot even defend your brothers and your sisters who are innocently being killed and you just laugh about it and say, well, yeah, and you shrug your shoulder and say, well, what can I do? Say something. Defend. Your brothers, defend your religion, defend your Rasul. What kind of religion are they following, boy? Eh? And people laugh. That is why Allah is, that is why your God or Allah teach you in Quran, in your Quran. And people just grin and skin and just bend their heads and you know why people do that? You know why people do that? Because they don't even know right from wrong. So how can they speak about Quran when they cannot even read the first letter in Quran. How can they defend the Prophet ﷺ when they don't even know anything about him? And if they knew something, they forgot. How can they defend Islam when they don't even know the basics? How can they defend the situation with Islam and Muslims in the world when they don't even know what's going on? Because they are not concerned about anyone else besides their own self. They are only concerned about their well-being. They are only concerned about themselves and what, at the end of the day, what I have, it's mine, and everyone else could just go up the road for like here. So how can they defend 
their Muslim brothers and their Muslim sisters in a foreign country that is being persecuted in some way or the other, how can they defend the hijab when they don't even know? They don't even know the reason behind hijab. They don't even know. How can they defend the laws of Allah when they don't even know the wisdom behind the reasons for revelation? How? These are the people who will grin and laugh and bend their heads in shame and can't say one word. Muslims need to educate themselves about Islam and about Quran and about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Allah Rabbi al is telling us that if you follow the ways of these people, then you will end up being a disbeliever. Allah Rabbi al goes on to say as a rule, not speaking about, I mean this is not speaking about a period in history. Allah is telling us about something that will remain constant until the day of Qiyamah. Allah is telling us in Quran, never will the Jews and the Christian approve of you. You can be their biggest of friends. But there is something in their heart. There is a deep hate in their heart towards you. You know why? Only because you are Muslim. People hate Muslims in the world today only because you are Muslim. Not because of your achievements. You are better than that person and you are better than this person. Not because of your wealth. Not because of your status in society. Not because of your possession. He will hate you only because you are Muslim. Oh, you are Muslim. And your name is sung in Muslimish. Your name is Khan. So, can't get an American visa. Only because your name is Khan. Your name is Ali. But you can't travel, you're on a no-fly list. When I was traveling and the airline told me, say, well, brother, you're on a no-fly list. <laughs> Yeah, they told me I'm on a no fly list. So, well, okay. So, they said, well, you travel to St. Vincent and this Caribbean island and that Caribbean island. And they call, him, uh, they call national security and, you know, they had it. And they said, yeah, yeah, he's on a no fly list. And they, they didn't even look at my passport to see if it had a St. Vincent stamp, an immigration stamp. But after I showed them that, then they had to call back national security and cleared up my name. So I'm no longer on the new files. <laughs> so they will hate you only because you're Muslim. Allah Rabbi al -Azza, he says that never will the Jews and the Christians approve of you till you follow their religion. Until you do that. Allah Rabbi al -Azza, he says, indeed, the guidance of Allah is the only guidance. It's the only guidance, and if you were to follow their desires, after what has come to you of knowledge, you will have no protector against you. You will have no protector against you. You will have no protector against the wrath of Allah when it comes to you. So now all these relationships and loyalties and the alliances that the Muslims had with their tribe, all the former alliances that they had with their tribe, it had to be negated, it had to be cut off, this relationship had to be cut off. And you just, you are just left with La ilaha illallah. And it's amazing how it starts. La ilaha illallah starts with negation. La ilaha illallah, it starts by negating every other thing. La ilah, there is no deity, there is no God, there is no one worthy of being worshipped. There is no one parallel to Allah in this entire creation. There is absolutely no being worthy of worship and praises. Illallah except Allah. So even even our kalima, it starts by negating a relationship towards every other religion, towards every other thing that is deemed as a deity, in some way or the other, this kalima starts by negating it. So if you were 
if you were belonging to another faith before, and you accept this religion, when you say, La ilaha illallah, you have negated everything in the past of your life. No longer can you go and sit and say, well, you know, it's relatives. Comes back down to the same thing. Well, it's my relative. How would you look? It's that special season of sharing and caring. So, you know, all my sisters and brothers and relatives will be there. How would you look if I did? Mind you, Muslims go. And they say, well, you know, how would you look? That's the statement. How would you look? So when you said, la ilaha illallah, you didn't negate all these things? It starts with negation. La is a word of negation. La means no. So it says there is no other deity worthy or parallel to me. There is no other one worthy of praises and worship besides me. Except Allah. Same thing here, the concept of Islam, the concept of al-wala wal-bara. This is a very important article of Iman. Al-wala wal-bara. Allah Rabbil Isa, he says in Surah Maida, what time is that, son? Allah Rabbil Isa, he says in Surah Al-Maida, verse 55 and 56, Inna ma waliyukum Allah. Allah says, Inna ma waliyukum Allah. Inna ma is used, it's, it's most of the time, it's translated as only. Or all the time it's translated as only. Allah says, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةٌ Verily, all believers are only but brothers to each other. Allah Rabbil Isa, He says, إِنَّمَا وَلِيُّكُمُ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا الَّذِينَ يُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَةِ Allah says, your ally is only, it is none but Allah. Your protector is no other than Allah. You have no friend except Allah wa Rasuluhu and his messenger. وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا الَّذِينَ يُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَةِ And those who believe, listen to the category. Allah is saying that you have no ally except Allah, his messenger. وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا الَّذِينَ يُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةِ And those people who believe, and those people who establish prayer, Allah says, وَيُؤْتُونَ الزَّكَاةِ And those people who pay their zakah, وَهُمْ رَاقِعُونَ And they bow down in prayer. These are your protectors. These are your allies. These are your friends. These are your awliya. Allah Rabbil Isa, he says that these are the ones who you should give your loyalty. Al-Wala wal-Bara is loyalty. Loyalty to deen. And no lip service. Allah, Islam is not in want of lip service. I mean, you can get a lot of that. Allah needs workers in this deen of his. Inshallah, we will continue next week. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. لمحمد خير الشمائل وكامل وهي الدلائل أخلاقه القرآن